Um, thank you for being here. It's been a very intensive day, a lot of amazing talks, so your mission during this one is to stay awake. Okay, uh, this is actually my first talk, so please wish me luck. I hope you enjoy it. So making front-end easier and faster by building our own framework. So our mission was to write less code, less code to maintain, less bugs to fix, so less errors, reduced bundles, less CSS, less JavaScript, and faster load times, so the page would load faster for better usability. The company was a large online travel agent with many, many white label brands and many other websites. So we weren't just dealing with one website, we were dealing with a lot of other websites as well. It's kind of pretty easy though, right? Yeah, just write less code, no bugs to fix. So I was like, I've got this, I can do this, no problem. But then we saw the code. There were 443 components. 972 components, if you included the versions that some components had. Components are obviously what builds up the web page, so you're talking about tabs, buttons, searchers. I know, 443, how, why? Don't ask, no idea. But that's what we had. And we had 12 websites, or 12 different themes. And we also had eight white label brands. So these was inside one of those websites was the white label brand and that would have other brands coming from that and that was increasing every single week as the sales guides would go out and get another white label brand on board for an online travel agency they were basically searching uh, their searcher there for searching for flights for example and they would just change the background color of the tabs or just very minor changes but all that code was also included in this so that was quite a lot of code so it basically wasn't as easy as we thought. We had a lot of circular dependencies. This is a great tool by Madge um, that you run with NPM. It's very difficult to see, but basically this was how our code was all connected together. This is a very small portion of it because it actually just crashed our computer every time we ran it. We could never ever see it to the end. And up at the very, very top in the top corner on the left, that's our main JavaScript file. That's like the sun beaming down. And everything was basically depending on this file. But also, as you can see, all those components, all these circles here are all components, and they're all depending on each other. So they weren't really very, well, they weren't really components, I guess. We had 2,500 pug includes. Pug was our templating language, that's what we were using. And we had 2,500 includes. Why on earth? I have no idea. Although I looked at the tabs component, and for the tabs component, we would include everything that you could possibly ever want in a tabs. So let's include the button component, the title component, the gallery, the carousel, and why not the calendar, and why not the weather, and then we would ship that. So any website that wanted to use that tabs component would have all the code it needed in case he wanted to add another component. So we were just including everything everywhere. We had 5,300 style imports, and we did not have 5,300 style sheets. So that was a hell of a lot of imports. Uh, I think at one stage, I counted one style sheet was imported 164 times. We only had 12 themes. So why was it being included 164 times? I have no idea. So this was basically um, a big problem, and trying to find out where everything was connected was very, very difficult. And we had 692 JavaScript includes. Again, that's a lot of JavaScript. We didn't have 692 JavaScript files, as you can see. They're just all including each other. And this was basically a big problem that we needed to sort out. And you're probably thinking, but it's not so bad, because you could have that, and Webpack could then basically just choose the ones you wanted or whatever. But we were not using those tools, so we were concatenating everything together. And if we included it twice, we were adding it twice. If we included it 10 times, that code was 10 times included in our big main JavaScript file. So pretty much, where do we start, right? This is my job, fix it, create a solution. Hello, my name is Debbie O'Brien. I am a front-end team lead at Todo Patterson in Mallorca, the lovely sunny island in Spain. I'm a mentor at Open Classrooms. I also work as a Slack moderator at Treehouse. 
I officially contribute to the Webpack docs. And I'm a former front-end architect at Blue Curie, which is where this project was created. And you can follow me at Debs underscore O'Brien on Twitter and Debbie O'Brien for LinkedIn. I hope you enjoy the talk. So we had to come up with a solution, right? We had to fix this. The bosses were depending on it. I was getting paid, so it had to be done. So first, we had to analyze the main problems. We could see that it was a mess, but we needed to figure out why, where it was all coming from. So for versioning, we had wrong versioning. Basically, we had copy and pasted subfolders of our components. So we would have our tabs component, and then someone would change the background color of that tabs component, so they would copy it, paste it, and call it version 2. And it would have all the JavaScript and all the CSS, and the only difference would be one color. And then version 3 would come along, which was a copy and pasted version of which one? I don't know. Nobody knew. And then there were mixed versions of the components in the same release, because sometimes they would copy it, but not copy all of it, and just modify something. So then you would need to ship version 1, version 2, and version 3. So it was basically just one big, massive mess of versions. Our styles were pretty much out of control. And there were themes folders inside the components. So basically, you open your component, you've got your tabs, and you go to your styles folder. And inside that, you had a folder for every single theme. We had 12 themes. So that was quite a lot of uh, themes inside the components, and they would change the background color for the theme of that one tabs component. And that tabs component should never care about what theme he is. He's a component, and the themes should be responsible for the theme. So this was quite a lot of um, CSS inside the component that we needed to get rid of. And there was unused themes that couldn't be removed. So we had 12 websites, but we had 20 plus themes. So there was a lot of themes that were there. Why? I have no idea. Maybe they were originally a website that got deleted, or maybe someone decided they were trying to fix something, create a theme, I don't know. But if you removed it, everything broke. So you had to keep it there. And sites were inheriting from other themes. So when you wanted to create another website that was based on, say, the travel agency website, it was very simple to copy and paste it and then, oh, I'll just include that one, and then this website has that, I'll just include that. So they were all related to each other, whereas they shouldn't be. One website should not be related to the other. But they were all inheriting from everywhere, so it was basically, in my opinion, out of control. We had very big bundles. All components were loaded always. Why not? And let's load all the component versions as well, because we might just need them. Just in case, let's load them all. This was leading to very, very bad performance. And our builds were taking 40 minutes. That meant every time we made one change and wanted to ship it to production, that took 40 minutes. Why does it take 40 minutes? I know you're all sitting there going, why does it take 40 minutes? Well, the icons had to run the icon task, then all the poke had to be rendered for all those 972 components. And even at that, it shouldn't take 40 minutes, but it was. We didn't get to the bottom of it. We just said we need to fix it. So I was like, come on, give me more, hit me, what else, what else, I can take it. Oh, seriously. So we had to come up with a plan, right? We needed to fix all this, we needed a solution. And we basically said, right, first thing we've got to do is a plan. We can't just build, we need a plan. So for our dependencies, we decided that libraries and vendors needed to be handled by a proper dependency management tool. We decided to use NPM, which is the package manager for Node. Before we were doing, and I'm sure most of you were also doing this one time in your lives, you were taking Bootstrap or jQuery's calendar, you were taking the code, you were copying it, you were pasting it, you were putting it in a folder called vendors, and then you were modifying all that code, and now it was your particular jQuery calendar, modified, it looks beautiful, and when you want to update that calendar, now you can't because you've modified the core code. And that's basically what we were doing. So our vendors folders were basically copy and pasted from the vendors. So we needed to get rid of that by using Package Manager. We could include them. They were coming from our Node Modules folder, so now our developers could not touch that code. If they wanted to modify anything, they could still create their vendors folder, and they would modify that one particular piece that they wanted to change. For the styles, we needed to create separation of styles between the projects. So this was key. Uh, basically, all projects or all websites needed to be separated, especially when it came to the, to the styles. And we needed to make sure that the component styles were at component level. So although we had the themes 
inside the components, we didn't always have all the CSS inside the component. We had other folders called base components, and those base components had the CSS of every single component that you might want or share across the websites. And this was not in the component folder, this was just in the theme folder. And then one theme might want to use that base component, say a button, well he would just include that from the other theme. So we needed to make sure that the button CSS was in the button component. And yet, no themes inside the components. The theme should not be inside there at all. The component's job is basically just to render that button, that's it, and the theme should decide if he's going to be orange, pink, yellow, or green, not the component. We wanted to introduce SAS maps to modify the themes. Because we were working with a lot of themes and a lot of uh, different brands, where the background colors, the colors, were all going to change a lot, but not just that, they would, because uh, you, you can say primary color or just be secondary color, but they would completely change the look and feel of their components. And using SAS maps, we decided it was going to give us um, some more freedom to be able to change those, those values. I'll go into SAS maps a little bit later, but if you've never used SAS maps, you should look into it. It's really cool. It's quite difficult to get the hang of, but it's very, very powerful. And we decided to add an RTL package for left to right websites. So we had a couple of websites that were being run in the Arabic market where everything goes the other way around. And what our developers would do is in the CSS or in the SAS, they would write if dollar left, padding left is this, if dollar right. And every time you added the word left or the word right, you had to write this if left, if right function. And anytime you wanted something changed, you were just constantly adding more CSS to your code just in case that one website might want to be used in the Arabic market or that one component. And that one component might not ever be used there, but it was very, very time consuming. There's an RTL package uh, from NPM, and you basically just NPM install RTL, and it does everything for you. It's really, really cool. If you're ever working in the left to right market, I suggest it. And then all you have to do is one line of code to change that, say, font, or change that one thing that you don't want to change. So that was basically something we needed to introduce. For the JavaScript, we needed to remove the logic in the Pug files. So Pug is a templating language. We should not have logic in our templating language. OK, Pug can do cool things like um, for loops, and this is fine. But you can actually write JavaScript in your Pug by just writing like one little dash. And by doing that, we were then putting every single JavaScript you could ever want for that component just in there in the Pug file. This was really, really bad because you couldn't run a linter on it, you couldn't test it. And even if you ran it in, in your code editor, you couldn't see if there was errors because it was in Pug's language, not in, in JavaScript. So this basically, um, we had to remove it from every single component. That was the plan. We decided to remove the T3 JavaScript framework. T3 is a framework by Box, not Dropbox, but Box. And I'm sure it's a very, very good framework created for them and specifically for them, and I'm sure it's great for them. But it was not good for us. It was not doing us any favors. It was complicating our lives, and we decided we need to just take it out. We removed TypeScript in favor of JavaScript. And I can see you, you're looking, going, why on earth would you do that? Everyone's moving towards TypeScript. TypeScript's cool, and I agree. But we were writing TypeScript without types. So we were just writing JavaScript in a TS extension. So why? So yeah, we basically said, look, don't do it, guys. Just write in JavaScript. Keep it simple. And all JavaScript at component level. So we did have JavaScript in our Pug files. And we also had some JavaScript in a big main. You've all had it. Yeah, main.js. And let's just stick it in there. We don't know where to put it. So we wanted to make sure that all JavaScript was at component level and not anywhere else. For the operations, we needed to use an application lifecycle that was going to handle our code sharing and reviews. So we wanted to add in code sharing and reviews. That was something the company had never had before. And it was quite difficult to introduce it because they kind of went, oh, but why do we need someone else to check my code? My code's great. I write great code. I don't need somebody to see my code. But once we actually brought it in, they were able to see that they actually become better developers just by sharing code and by reviewing each other's code. Because sometimes you can just say, if you write the function this way, you're going to achieve this. And someone else can go, oh, I didn't know that. And they will actually learn from it. So if you're not doing code sharing and reviews, I really suggest you, you implement it. We added linting. 
Uh, ESLint and SASLint were the ones we were using. Um, this is just making sure that all your code is written in a kind of standardized format. Not really too strict on your you know, spaces, etc., but more on how many parameters in your functions and making sure your BAM is written correctly for the SAS, etc. The day we introduced linting, I had a lot of front-end developers shouting at me because all their code basically couldn't be couldn't go into production. Um, they told me that there were errors everywhere and I needed to get rid of them. I was like, just fix your errors, write clean code. That's what the linters are there for, to help you and tell you so that you can actually write better code. We actually had to take that back. If you ever gonna introduce a linter, don't just introduce it and say, okay, linters are now, are now working. Tell your team you're gonna introduce the linter and they've got a week to clean their code. Otherwise, they'll all shout at you. And we want to introduce testing and versioning. We never had any testing ever at all in the whole company. And everyone says, no, we don't have time for testing. Nobody has time to write tests. But tests are actually well worth writing. Remember, we were sharing our code across 12 websites. So that one component was basically running across 12 websites and those other brands. So that's like 20 websites. And if we broke it on one, we broke it on 20. So just by adding some testing in, we used Mocha and Chai, or that's what we were gonna, at this stage, we were planning to use. Uh, by adding testing, we would make sure that, that component was stable across all websites. And we want to add in versioning, so not copy and pasted, um, but basically using Node Package Manager, so you would have proper versioning, and you knew that that version was stable, or if it was gonna break, that at least you could deal with it first. Packaging, building, and releasing. Um, we started using Webpack. We were using Gulp before. Gulp is great, but it's a lot of work. And we had a lot of Gulp files that we had to maintain, one to concatenate the JavaScript, one for the CSS, one for this. There was, there was a lot. And just by using Webpack, we actually just cleaned up a lot, of our, a lot of our code. It's much better. And we were using Microsoft DevOps for all our deployment. So that's what I call a plan, right? This was great. This was the plan. This is what we proposed to the CEO, to the managers, and they all went, yep, sounds good. Off you go. So we had to go ahead. So now, where do we start? Meet Alexandria. Isn't she cute? Alexandria is our custom front-end framework. Yeah, I know, I know. Another bloody front-end framework. But Trivago have got their own framework. Uber have got their own framework. Did you know that? So why couldn't we have their own framework? I mean, yes, there's, there's Vue, there's Angular, there's React. There's some very, very good frameworks out there. However, we need a solution that suited our business needs. And I'm not saying that Vue or React or Angular could not have suited our business needs, but we had a hell of a lot of problems to fix. And we decided that if we custom built something, at that time, we decided if we custom built something, we could fix every single problem you could ever imagine having. And we could write the code that was necessary to do it and basically provide a better framework. That was our frame of mind as we, as we were building this. And there was no extra training for the team. As websites were being built every single day, the pace of work is very, very fast. We could not have gone into our developers and said, learn React, you've got a week. Because it just wasn't gonna happen. And remember, the bosses were happy, right? They were like, I like this plan. So, you know, we had to go ahead to build Alexandria. So come on, give her a chance. This is Alexandria. She's our custom front-end framework, and Alexandria targets the proper use of current technologies and simplification when possible. That was the key to this project, simplification. So this is what we achieved. So this is Alexandria, this is the package structure. At the very, very top is Alexandria. She's just a very basic rendering engine built in Node and Express. And her job is to render the pug, render the SAS, to, to render everything, to bundle it, to pack it all together. And also includes some dev tools. So it's pretty, pretty simple. Uh, it was a very, very lightweight package. And it was doing exactly what we wanted to do and it was shipped um, with NPM. And then we had Alexandria components. So Alexandria Components is kind of like your bootstrap library, only it's specifically created for our needs. So it would have a price component or a rating component, components that were basically what we needed to make a travel agency website work. This was also shipped as an NPM package. 
Alexandria styles were a basic styles package that include nothing more than your primary colors, your secondary colors, uh, your grid, your base, your reset, everything you needed to get started, but nothing more. And then we had an icons package, so we had all our icons, or SVGs, shipped into a package and into NPM. And then we had the brand. So the brand was our online travel agency or any other website that was basically uh, that we were producing. The brand would be responsible for telling us what colors they wanted that page to be. So in the brand, this would be primary color is red, secondary color is blue, etc. The brand would also load the header and footer component and any meta components or any components that were used across all of the websites of that brand. This is where it gets a little complicated because we were working in a very complicated situation because we had a business line. So it's a massive travel agency where you have a brand, but inside you have basically small companies that make up the cruises are one company, the flights are another company, and etc. But we needed to have the same header and footer. So the brand, having a brand package, solved that issue for us. Other websites did not need a business line project, they just needed the brand. All of this is built as separate packages, which means that you could take any one of them away and everything would still work. You could take away Alexandria components and install Bootstrap components. You could even take away Alexandria rendering engine and install Vue. So it was built that basically we could change absolutely everything or install what we wanted or not install it if we didn't want it. And as you can see, everything was going down in one direction. So our styles, what we managed to achieve with our styles was before we had manual style imports. This was a very manual, tedious task. So for the website, in order to include the component styles, we would come along here and we would take the import line and we would manually copy it and we would paste it. And now we were including the component legal text, the component iframe chart, etc. So this was a way of including that. There was also a variables one that we had to manually go and include that one. So for that one website of the travel agency website, there was 220 style imports to maintain on that style sheet. What happened if you decided you were not going to use one of those components anymore? Well, what you had to do is manually go in and delete it, correct? However, if you deleted one of those lines of code, something broke because one of those had a dot title CSS and someone else had a dot title and the inheritance of that dot title saying background color or color white was basically coming from another component. So just removing it or changing the order would modify maybe not your website, but maybe someone else's website, because this could have been also imported into another website. So this was something that we needed to, um, to get rid of to solve this problem. It was very difficult to maintain, and it was creating duplicate styles as well, because it was included twice, you would ship it twice. Using Alexandria, we ended up using automatic style imports with zero styles so zero style imports to maintain. So this was basically um, a massive plus for our developers who never had to think of this anymore. How did we do this? Um, Alexandria had a render from model function that would look at the model, so the data, so that, that would basically say the components I want to run to use on this website are component A, component B, so say the tabs, the product card, etc. And those components would then, he would render it from the model and he would take the CSS that was needed and basically create all that CSS. So no more style imports to maintain because Alexandria's rendering function would, would do that for us. Webpack would bundle it, minify it, and post CSS would remove any duplicates in case we were including it twice. So this was a, a major plus that we solved. For the SAS, before we were using SAS variables, I'm sure you've all used SAS variables, and they're, they're um, pretty OK if you use them right. We were not using them right. We had dollar, header, full, image, searcher, nav, tabs, item, active, border, it goes on, background, color. Um, dollar, header, full, image, searcher, nav, tabs, item, active, color. So you go along and change that and try and make a modification to that code. By the time you go down and find it, it's very, very complicated. It takes a long time, it's difficult to understand, and making changes was very time consuming. We introduced SAS maps. So SAS map over on the other side is basically like a JSON structure, so it's really easy to see. And you can use short names, as you can see, like the image. The image has a border top style and a vertical align and a width. And inside that one, that's inside, say, the button style, the button SAS map. And then you could have a tabs SAS map that would have an image. 
And because you have two maps that are not talking to each other, you don't need to then specify all this dollar header full image search or nav taps to separate your components. So this was a much better way of writing our SAS. Remember, we were using a lot of themes. If you're not going to use themes, you don't need all this kind of structure. But if you're going to make, be making changes across many different themes, SAS maps makes your life a lot easier. For our icons, uh, we had an icon packages, and we decided to use embedded SVG icons. Before, we were using um, icon fonts. So we were taking all our SVG icons, we were using Gulp, and we were basically converting them all to fonts. By using embedded SVG icons, we had less CSS code to write. OK, because we, we didn't have to write before and after, so our CSS dropped. But yes, our HTML rose. So you've got to balance, and you've got to decide which is the right one. We went for this one because they were easier to position. We had better CSS control. So if you wanted to change, for example, the different outline color instead of all the color, you could do that with the SVGs. Whereas with a font, you have to change every single color. We had better accessibility, and we had quicker builds. So we didn't have to run that gulp icon task that was going to convert it every single time. This was something we were doing every time in development, every time we added a new icon, and every time we shipped to production. So just taking that away and using embedded SVG icons got rid of um, a lot of problems for our builds. And we had less server requests, and we had no more icon problems. What does that mean? Well, sometimes when you run um, the gulp task and the numbers are out of sync, because you're translating your SVGs to icons, you've got this number, yeah? And it's going to translate your, your font into what it should look like. And if that is out of sync, you have problems that look like this. And you might not see that from very far away, but basically what you need to see is all those circles is the wrong icon. So we were selling uh, packages of people sitting down, great holidays for the gym, flights with free pizzas, hotels that you have to walk for. And yeah, it was just really, really, really bad. And if you wanted to contact us, you just had to send us a present or a trophy. <laughs> and this is not funny because it is funny, but it's not funny because this was on our, our website, but was on all our clients' websites. So you imagine the boss has come along and saying, what's gone wrong? Fix it. And you're like, OK, no problem. I'll run the gulp task again. Bang, fixed. But remember, our code took 40 minutes to ship to production. So for a minimum of 40 minutes, those icons were live on the site on more than one occasion. So just by using embedded SVG icons, we were able to solve that problem. And that never, ever happened again. For our components, uh, we used a component structure. This is the folder over here of the component. This is the links component. And basically, um, all components are self-contained. And each component had a main index.js file that was at the bottom. And that file was basically going to render the pug. In that file, you could basically also decide if you wanted to render another component inside that component um, and modify certain things that we had, like, say, the button. You could choose if you wanted a primary one, if you wanted the small, uh, what class you wanted to add to. So that was all done in the index.js. And then we had our client folder, and that was where all the client CSS and the browser JavaScript lived. So if you were running any styles, it would go in there. Our SAS maps would go in there. And our JavaScript for carousels, for example, would go in there. And as you can see, there are no themes folders. So before that, this looked like that, basically the same. We didn't modify much, except we took away all the themes. And we kept the structure quite similar to what we were using. So it was very easy to migrate into this. And you had a dist folder that basically was what Webpack did. And the mocks folder was where you would put your data. So if you wanted mock data, you would put it in there so you could see it. And the views, we would continue to use uh, Pug because our developers were used to it. They were very good at working with it, so we kept that. For the component package, so we decided to start using mini components. This was something that they were not doing before, whereas we have a price component, and that price component could be put into the product card. And we had like three or four different product cards, because depending on where it was on the page. But we had three or four different prices copy pasted and put into those components. So we needed to separate all those mini components, like the price, oh, it went too fast, and, um, and put them in there. This basically helped us with less CSS duplicates, less CSS conflicts. And it was obviously a lot quicker to implement and maintain, because you just include price. 
Um, the styles were modified at brand level, so this we had to make sure that our styles were at the brand level. In the component itself, it did not decide to modify um, the color of this. This is basically the price, color price, and that price is set in the brand. Your price is going to be yellow in brand A. In brand B, it's going to be pink. Why would you want a pink? I don't know, but maybe you would. And modifications would only affect your brand. So in brand B, you decided, no, I don't want to be pink today, I want to be blue. Well, he would be blue, but he would not affect brand A. That was basically key. So this gave us a lot of better control. And we added full testing for all those components. Every single component we wrote, we wrote with testing. We used Mocha and Chai, and every single one was fully tested, which meant if anyone was going to include a component from our component library, uh, it was going to work perfect. We were sure of it. And if anyone, any other developer, decided to modify that component, the build would fail because the tests would fail. So we couldn't break anything on another website. So that was just uh, a big key to our, to our components. And finally, we had consistency across all pages. So our, our drop-down looked the same, our select box looked the same, our button looked the same. Remember, we have business lines, so we have different business lines, like different companies, all under the one brand. So making sure consistency is key shows to you, the clients, that it's only one company, even though under the hood it's probably others. For our component development, uh, we basically, this is kind of, yeah, over here on the left, this is how we basically would work in development. This was a tool that was created for us um, by another company, and you had to select if you wanted desktop or mobile, and then you had to basically choose the component that you wanted to see, or work with, and then you had to select the application, and then you had to basically choose which website, which theme, and then click on the skin, and then click which JSON file you wanted to load, and that was like seven clicks later, you finally see your component. And then you go, oh no, that's not the component I wanted, and then you have to go in seven clicks later, and then you go and see the component you want. So this was really, really slow process, and basically, uh, we couldn't continue working in this way. So we fix this with an NPM script, so just using like a dev loader, uh, you write NPM start layout and you see the layout component straight away, just like any other normal framework should be doing. And you could choose the component um, and you can see like the dash M is basically the model, so the data that you want, if you want to see a logged in version or if you want to see a data of a logged out version. So you could very quickly, just by typing a couple of lines a couple of, well, one line of code, a couple of words, you could basically see the component in many different forms. You could see it with real data. This was something we weren't able to see before. Um, so if you wanted to see that website in Spanish, you just had to basically load the Spanish data file and you could see it in Spanish. You could correct then any mistakes before you shipped it to production. Before we would only know if it was okay and when we put it up in production and we went, oh, that text is too long in Spanish, okay, fix it. So just by able to see real data, um, it helped development um, a lot. It made development a lot easier. So basically, yeah, with the NPM script, we were seeing things direct in our project. Uh, it was quicker rendering, quicker development, and we could see all components with variations. Because as you can see from this tool, uh, you've got to see one component, then check another. If a developer is basically needs a product card, and let's see what product cards we have, you've got to Seven times click, product card one. Seven times click, let's see product card two. No, I don't want that one. Seven times click, let's see product card three. No, I don't want that one. Pfft, forget it, I'll just build my own, it's quicker. So we were able to create a, basically like a mini shop of components. So just by running one command with NPM, we could see absolutely every single component and all its variations that were available to you. So the developer could see, okay, that's the component I want, or no, I don't want this, now I'll make my own one. For versioning, uh, we had wrong versioning. So as I mentioned earlier, we had copy and pasted uh, code, and that was basically called version one or version two. And was version three a copy of version one, or was it a copy of version two? And this is an interesting example of the code here, where we're including the package model product search of version two, and we're including version one of version two, and we're including version one of version three, and we're including version one of version four. So yeah. Don't ask me, I have no idea why. This was basically wrong, and we fixed our versioning using NPM and using semantic versioning. So basically, Alexandria code was all properly versioned, the packages and the components. And if you don't know what semantic version is, basically the 1.2.5, so the five is a patch, that would basically mean a very, very small modification. Everything's fine, you're not gonna notice it. 
a two, this point two is a minor one, this was a minor change, you'd notice something, but your code's gonna be okay. And one, we were gonna break something. So if you're gonna upload this, check production, check everything, watch out, this is dangerous. For builds and performance, our bundle size was 557 KB. This was uh, bigger than the recommended 250 KBs. Whether that's too big or too small is not the point. The point is that we got it down to 139 KBs. So that's less than the 250 recommended, and that's a 70 to 80% weight loss. So that was a pretty big win. That's all our JavaScript and CSS. Our server request was 53 CSS and JavaScript requests. So that was quite a lot of requests that we were loading. And we got that down to four CSS and JavaScript requests. Only two if we were using one website, but four if you were using the main travel agency website that had to load the brand CSS and JavaScript for the brand and the one for the actual business line. Our build time was 40 minutes, okay? It was, and this was me being nice, because it was 40 minutes, but every time they built or added a new website or a new component, that time was increasing by the minute. And during this project, it got up to just over an hour, and it was pretty, it was pretty, pretty bad. It was really bad. We got this down to basically three minutes. So a three minutes build with Alexandria, the same page, exactly the same page was rendered and built and shipped to production in three minutes. That's a big difference. Our page load was 10 seconds. Seriously, it was, and, and it's actually live. You can actually go and check it. It's really, really bad. It's really, really slow. And um, to use it, to interact with it, it's just, it wasn't good. And we got it down to 1.5 seconds. And this was something you can only measure as soon as you've deployed. So we could say, yes, in development, it's really fast. This is going to be fast in production. Trust me, trust me, trust me. But until you actually ship it and put it into a proper environment, you cannot test it. And if you load the page, we were like, wow, this is just super fast lightning. It's, it was so, so fast. So that was a basically a big improvement. So here's what we achieved. We achieved less code to maintain, less bugs to fix, because now we had testing, so we practically didn't have any bugs. Reduced bundles, as you see, in our CSS and our JavaScript was much, much lower. And we had faster load times, so now for our clients, it was much quicker to interact with the page. And we had better SEO results. This is something that I only found out um, last week. They called me and they said, um, after testing it for two months, the SEO, the Google ranking, we've gone up, and basically they gave the OK. Um, for the SEO, which is what they were very, very worried about. And so Alexandria lived happily ever after. The bosses were happy and they said, okay, Alexandria is working. So now basically, this is not going very good, is it? One, two, yay. <laughs> so basically, um, they decided the next plan is now to ship every single website over into Alexandria. So that basically means taking the cruises one has already been shipped over, so now we've got to take the um, the flights, that's the next one, or the packages, holidays, and start moving them all over to Alexandria. The plan is by the end of next year to have everything migrated into the new framework. Well, that's the plan. Whether it will happen or not, I don't know. So basically, if you were to ask me, would I recommend you build your own framework? The answer is no, do not do this at home. Seriously, this is crazy. What we did is absolutely crazy, do not recommend it. Use Vue, use React, use Angular. However, if you look, we achieved everything that we needed to achieve. Less code to maintain, less bugs to fix, reduced bundles, faster load times, and better SEO results. So did we do a good job? Did we do it right? We basically built a solution for our company. Do I recommend you do the same? It depends on your situation. You have to decide that. We actually did a test and we basically did the exact same thing, we moved it into view. Just to test it out and to basically see, would it work, would it be the same? What would we gain from moving it into view? And yes, view is, I, lo I love view. I would work with view every single day. I also love React, don't worry. And um, the only thing was that there was a lot of cool features that we wrote in Alexandria that are not in view. So if we wanted to achieve the exact same results, we would have to maybe write some view plugins or something like that. But Alexandria was working for us, so we thought we had done a good job. The bosses were happy, so yeah, Alexandria lives on to this day. 
How long she will last, I do not know, but yeah, don't try this at home. So thank you very much.